So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a mom. I'm a wife. <laughs> my family's up there. Uh, my husband Rashid is right here. Um, I am a student and a, and a teacher. You know, I went to University of Maryland, a couple of business degrees. I have a master's in uh, master's science in cybersecurity, as well as a MBA. And um, I'm the in, I'm a military veteran. I was in the Air Force, um, and my husband was in the Air Force too. That's kind of how we met. We retired here in San Antonio. I'm originally from Wisconsin. Uh, I'm the inventor of SIFTIES, that crazy looking thing right there, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, I have a podcast. It's uh, for Amazon sellers. So many entrepreneurs get started on Amazon. Um, so I have a podcast for them, and uh, we're pretty high in the charts for marketing in the United States, so we're pretty proud of that. I have a business consultancy firm called Amazing at Home. Um, this is where I help entrepreneurs. Um, when I went off to invent a product, um, it was tough because even though I have several business degrees, I'm a pretty smart girl, I've got, you know, I'm a military strategist and planner, nobody told me what I was supposed to do with inventing a product. And when you research online, all you find is like invent help, right? Yeah. And how much money do they want to just just to just to draw something up for you? You know, thirty thousand dollars maybe to start with. And so I got so frustrated. You know, I I thought I'm smart. I can figure this out. You know, there's if I've proved anything to myself in my life is if I put my mind to something, I can do it. And so I started figuring it out. I started cold calling manufacturers. I started, you know, some of them hung up on me. <laughs> Others um, said, you should probably get that thing prototyped. And I was like, what's a prototype? I, how do I do that? Right? And so I just kept reaching out to people, kept talking to people, and I didn't give up. And everywhere along the way, I would share my story online. So I started blogging about it. I started reaching out, and I started getting this tiny little, but very loyal following um, of other entrepreneurs who also had a dream, who also wanted to do something, but couldn't get the help that they needed. And they couldn't believe that I was giving this information away for free. They're like, how, how is this possible, you know? And so pretty soon they started asking to consult with me. So here I am launching my brand, I'm doing all these things, I'm working a full-time job, uh, you know, and I'm like, man, you know, something's gotta give here. And before I knew it, I had more clients than I knew what to do with and I was turning down calls. But the people that I was helping were gaining great success. We're talking six figures a month, one product in the marketplace. I knew that I had a knack for helping people. I knew that I had something. And so all of a sudden, what I thought I was on this journey to invent a product turned around to be on a journey to help other entrepreneurs do the same. So that's where Amazing at Home was born. Um, and then <laughs> on that journey, I met some other entrepreneurs and, um, and uh, I started this little company called the Canton Fair Experience. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of the Canton Fair. Who's heard of the Canton Fair? Anyone? Okay, a couple people. So the Canton Fair is in China, it's in Guangzhou, China. And it is the world's largest exposition of suppliers in the world, right? Well, the world's largest in the world. That was redundant. Anyway, <laughs> there's over 60,000 booths of manufacturers. 60,000. If you had to walk it, it's three airports, the size of three airports. It is 217 football fields of products, of manufacturers. You can go and touch products and feel them and talk to your suppliers and source <coughs> products. So I had friends in my network that were going to Canton all the time and they'd come back and they'd post on Facebook, they'd have videos and stuff. And I'm like, man, I want to go there. That looks so cool. And I asked one of them, you know, um, very senior to me, much more experienced, had plenty. Of, he had invented many brands, had many things in the marketplace. I asked him, hey, will you take me with you? And, uh, and he was like, yeah, let's go. And then the following wanted to come too. They were like, well, we wanna go. You guys are going, we're going. So that's how the Canton Fair Experience was born. We said, we can't just take you to China. You need to be prepared before you go to China. You, know, you can't just go there and find a manufacturer. So my partner, Steven and I, we said, okay, if we had to come up with something to actually teach entrepreneurs how to do this from start to finish, 
how to do product development and design and learn about manufacturing and the processes and learn negotiation and all these things, how would we do it? And we did it. We put together this 200 page book. We put together over 40 hours of coursework and we called people from around the world and now they come to China with us twice a year. And we just took our second trip. And so we're going again in April, it's really fun. But anyway, so that's how the Canada Fair experience was born. And I also have another company called Digital Fire. We help with uh, training for e-commerce. And I just acquired a software company called Rebate Chat, and that is just for shopping and deals. So that's kind of fun. Can, um, let me say something real quick. The sure. Canton Fair, uh, whoever got our announcement uh, that was sent out, uh, they have information. Well, it's actually on our website too. But uh, if you look at the announcement and the write up, you'll find links on there. And one of the links has to do with their trip you went to the Canton Fair. I would suggest you, you, you watch that because it's very, very pictorial. It's very, very, um, you can see how, 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 you know, glamorous or how, you know, a lot of people think of China as being kind of, yeah, you know, but this really shows the other side of China. And I thought, uh, I thought it was very well done. It's what, about a half hour long or so? 30, 20, 20, it was, it was, you know, uh, it had a pretty good links to it, and I would suggest you know you go to it and look at it because that's it was enlightening to me. So, whatever. Definitely, our goal is always to give back, so we try to give as much free training as possible along with our program. So, all right, so Sifties, this is my product. Um, this here is my product, right? So, how did I go on this journey to invent this product? Um, first of all, I started by being annoyed with the current solutions. I have chronic severe migraines. Uh, that means I get 15 or more migraines a month and they're triggered by smells and cat boxes stink a little bit. <laughs> Who has cats? Anybody have cats? Okay. Yeah. You know, you know, you know about scooping, you know about it. It's not fun. So, uh, you know, we were cleaning the litter boxes. Rashid will say I was cleaning the litter boxes <laughs> twice a day and they still stunk. I was like, gosh, there has to be a better way. So of course, every time I'd go TDY, I'd be sketching. What do you think I was sketching? I was sketching a litter box, right? Because I thought the problem was the litter box. I could somehow make a better litter box. So every time I'd have my little sketchbook out. I know all you inventors out here are sketching stuff up all the time. So I'm, I'm just figuring this out. All of a sudden, I wake up two o'clock in the morning one morning and I'm just like, <gasps> The problem is the litter box. Oh my goodness, the problem is the litter box. We are contaminating the litter by messing around with the scoop. And what happens with a sifting litter box? I don't know, those of you who have cats, you have cats, what happens with the sifting litter box? Does the goop get stuck on there? It's gross, it's just, gr it's gross. Nobody, I mean, for us, we humans, you know, we figured it out. We got toilets, you know. I mean, why can't we're yeah, we're still picking up dog doo doo, and we're still scooping up treasures in the cat litter box, you know. So I was like, there has to be a better way, you know. So I wake up at two o'clock in the morning, and I literally start pulling apart one of those mesh laundry bags, you know, like that kind of looks like the back of that chair over there. I'm pulling it apart, and I'm laying it over the bin. Like, like a tote bin, and I just start like pouring and I'm making a total mess. Two o'clock in the morning, he's used to that, poor guy. Uh, <laughs> but I'm like, okay, I have something here. So I go to Home Depot and I build my first prototype. And of course I'm scared, right? I'm like, well, what, what if this guy at Home Depot steals my idea? Oh my I know God. now, I know now that 99% of people have ideas and they don't do anything with them because people always tell me their ideas. Like, you're going to do something with my idea. I'm going to tell it to you. Great. So, you know, I go out there. I build my prototype. I take, like, mesh, basically, um, metal mesh, and I put it on a wooden frame, and I stick it over a wastebasket like this. And it works great. You just pick up the litter box, you pour it in, and you're done. The nasty stuff stays on top. The clean stuff stays to, through to the bottom. At first I thought I was just inventing something to make it easier to clean the cat box because we were cleaning it twice a day. Well, all of a sudden we were using this ugly prototype and we didn't smell anything anymore. We used to dump the whole cat box once a week because you know, it just gets nasty, right? All of a sudden the litter didn't stink anymore. We brought people with dogs. How many people are dog people? Got dog people in here? Oh man, you dog people. Okay, so I brought you into my laundry room, okay, where I have three cat litter boxes 
couldn't smell a thing. I knew I had something and I knew I had something huge and I knew the litter box could not compete with me. But I also knew that I was gonna have to educate customers because to this day I still get returns because people are like, it's not a litter box. That's right, it's not a litter box. <laughs> so it's one of those things when you invent something that's kind of new to the category, you have to do more customer education, right? So that's kind of where I went through. I had these, these aha moments. I started prototyping. Um, I, I realized that I had to, um, that I needed to get, to get this thing. This is actually 3D printed, this right here. This is the actual size of the sipping basket. Um, we built in these little feet so that after you're done, so this goes over the top of the bin and the bin comes with it, right? So you buy the whole unit and you just dump your litter box in there. The nasty goes right here and you just tilt it in the pile of nasty here and then it goes right into a bag. When you're done, you put this down to the side, you pour the clean litter back in the box and you're finished. So what used to take me 15 minutes of sweeping and scooping and nasty, now it takes me less than a minute and I can clean three litter boxes at once. So it's a game changer for people who have multiple cats. And guess what? If you do your market research, there are over 54 million cat owners in the United States of America alone. So do I have a market? Yes, I do. Now, everybody doesn't use clumping litter, but most people do. And so I think 1% of that market is enough for me, right? <laughs> so this was our first, our final 3D printed prototype. We built this 3D printer ourselves. Um, and you know, we, we got it out there. It was really fun. And then we painted it and shellacked it and everything else and used it in our first videos. Um, so that's kind of my story of the stinky cat litter box. Um, I sell this product on amazon.com and, um, on, uh, and on my website. And this year I'm expanding into big box retailers. But the problem was that bin right there is huge. It's eating up all of my margins because to ship that direct to consumer costs a lot of money, people. <laughs> And so what I thought were really great margins for a $40 product got all eaten up by shipping. Now when I move into retailers, I'm also taking up more space on the retailer shelf. So I need to shrink this thing down. And I thought, how in the heck am I gonna shrink this thing down? Enter Canton Fair. I go to Canton Fair, I see a laundry basket, a collapsible laundry basket. This laundry basket actually collapses completely down flat. It has wheels too, but I'm not doing the wheel thing. But anyway, this was one of the first samples that I ever received from a manufacturer in China. Um, and so now we just did our final sample and we're doing a relaunch. We made this all completely seamless in here. This is uh, easily wipe out uh, a bowl, you know. Uh, nothing wet goes into this bin anyway, but it's got a waterproof uh, lining. And again, this completely collapses. So now what goes on store shelves is just the size of this. It's a game changer for my business. I've got people all over the world requesting this product and I can't get it to them because it's too big. So I'm so excited this year that I'm able to relaunch my product with the actual fully collapsible bin and just the size of the sifting bin. So the moral of that story is even though you launch a product, it doesn't mean that you won't have to continue fixing it up. It doesn't mean you won't have to continue on your journey to making it better. You're gonna get great customer feedback during that time. So be ready to continue to innovate and don't rule anything out. Who would have thought a laundry basket would work, right? But it does. So that's the story of, of Sifties. So how do I help brands now launch products? So many brands start on Amazon. Why do you think they start on Amazon? Anybody have any? Market Sorry? reach. Market reach, it's pretty big, right? It's only 5% of all of retail, um, but it's 50% of online retail. So, and then why else do you think they start on Amazon? Yes, sir. There's no barriers to entry. Exactly, there's no barriers to entry. Today, literally, you could go to Walmart and buy a product and go list it on Amazon for three times as much and sell it and make a profit. It is that easy to have an online business, right? Now it's not that easy. Obviously you should probably have a business and all those other things, but there's low barriers to entry. So we always recommend that new brands start on Amazon and on their own website or a little bit of both because it's very easy and there's no barriers to entry. 
Um, brands. Amazon has their own brands, right? Private label is really, really popular now. You go to Walmart, you go to Target, you see all of their own private label brands. Amazon's brands actually make up about 80% of the billions of dollars of sales that come through Amazon. But 19% are actually other brands, third-party brands like mine. So there's a lot of revenue going to other brands. But 70% of the searches on Amazon are generic, meaning men's t-shirt, shoes. Only 30% are brand specific, so Nike, Adidas, right? I don't know why we're, we're sticking with shoes today, right? <laughs> so some people call Amazon a brand buster because Amazon has been reported to copy some of these popular brands and bring out their own version of it, right? That's why as inventors, it's really important for you to have that differentiation and to protect your idea because then you're preventing big brands with a lot of money from just knocking you off immediately, right? So there are 3,000 sellers joining Amazon marketplaces every single day. There are millions of sellers on Amazon. 3,000 sellers joining every single day. But of those millions of sellers, only 20,000 of those millions were able to actually build a business. So the number of Amazon sellers with more than $100,000 sales, $100, in sales per year, that's sales revenue, that's not profit. In 2015, 70,000. In 2016, 100,000. In 2017, 140,000. Why? Well, number one, margins. Nowadays, average retail margins, there's so much of a price war, right? These brands are putting them out there, they don't have enough margin and they're failing. And so they're not able to quit. They started as a side gig and they're not able to turn it into a business. They get stuck, right? They can't treat it, a, they can't treat it as a full-time job. They can't treat it as a business. So less than 20,000 were able to actually build a business. Less than 1% of the sellers, over 1 million US-based sellers, not to mention the sellers all around the world, Less than 1% of those generate more than 20 billion in sales. So not a lot of people really making it well. It's like any saturated marketplace, right? There's only going to be a few leaders. So how do we become the leader? Of those brands that do really, really well on Amazon, right? And they do really well in the marketplace. They have a website, they're doing everything well, they're reaching an audience. How do they make it past the sharks? Who do you think said this? People always think you have to have a great idea. Great ideas are cheap. Execution is hard. Mark Cuban. Nope. Robert Herjavec. Mm. But good guess. I like it. <laughs> so execution is hard. Would we agree? Yeah, How many people have successfully brought a product to market in this room? All right. So, I mean, we have our, our 40%, right? But it wasn't, it wasn't a business, so it was a license. Oh, there you go. License deals. <laughs> hey, those count. Those count, right? There's a lot more work in the, in the business side of things because execution is hard. That's the reason why you're licensed. I knew that to start with. <laughs> there you go. He's a smart man over here. So, three reasons for failure in the tank. The first reason. Is it unique? So, do you guys remember this guy, the eye block guy? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, you want me to well, either, maybe? Either oh. way. But okay. Just... Am I in your way? You can't see. All right. So, you guys remember this this invention right here? What was it? You remember this? The eye block? Laptop camera, right? Yes. Yeah. He blocked the laptop camera. He came into the Shark Tank and he was like, "Boy, sharks! Do I have an idea for you? Cybersecurity." Huge, people are hacking cameras all over the place. I have the solution. Da, 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 the eye block. And uh, I think it was either Mark or Robert who was like, uh, yeah, I just use a piece of tape. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I need your product? Is it unique? Is there a better mousetrap? Is there a reasonable alternative, right? So it's easily copied too, right? Like how hard is that to copy? You know, if you have a design patent on it, good luck, right? <laughs> so the second thing, do you have any sales? 
So this guy here, he made this puzzle toy. Um, and he got a, it was like a puzzle toy for kids. And he got a deal, he didn't have any, sh any sales yet. But he was offering 40% of his business. And I think he got a deal with Damon John. But um, it was contingent on him getting some toy companies interested in a licensing deal, right? They weren't interested. Why? Look at, I mean, is it different enough? How many puzzle toys are on the market, really, right? If you don't have that audience already, if you don't have proven sales, you got problems. So his deal, he got that deal, but it fell through because he was not able to secure um, licensing deals. Maybe he needed somebody like George in his corner. So, who projected sales revenue. You know, his, his projected sales revenue were just, they weren't good, you know? So then, number three, this business isn't scalable. Grocery products, right? Like the grocery products, the sharks always run. They're like, no, I don't want to be part of that. I don't want to try to get my product. I don't want to try to get your product on the shelf in a grocery store. So these ladies invented like these healthy soups, right? And they were they were like delivering healthy soups, and you could buy it on their website and stuff like that. But their margins were only their profit margin was only five percent. That's not enough for a shark to scale it, right? It's not enough. So, you know, and then they were pursuing too many sales outlets. So they were trying to go to every grocer, every, but they were doing well on their website. And with 5% margins, how are you gonna get in a retailer? That's not gonna work, right? So these are three examples of reasons for failure in the Shark Tank. So how do we do better than these guys? So as you mentioned in, in my write up here, uh, Jack Trout wrote this book, Differentiate or Die, in our Canton Fair Experience course, we really focus on differentiation and helping people to define their differentiation because that is what you have to communicate to consumers. That's what you have to communicate to retailers to buy your product, right? Um, all these companies utilize this concept, right? Apple, you know, Lush, T-Mobile, Dollar Shave Club, they all utilize these concepts. When you think of big brands that do it well, they differentiate well and they communicate their differentiation well. So my little quote here, we're the kings of differentiation as inventors, right? We're like, I have this unique idea, it's so cool. But it doesn't matter if we don't differentiate in a way that matters to the customer. Are you actually solving a problem? What are you doing and can you communicate that to the customer? So I'm gonna show you some ways that you could do that. So for example, as we mentioned, today's consumer is enlightened. They're educated, they're aware. When a customer discovers your product online or in-store, this is what my website looks like, right? I can show videos of my product in action. <coughs> There's no competition. <coughs> I can speak directly to the consumer. What happens when they go on Amazon and search for my product? Hmm, I created a new category here, right? I eliminate odors. I make it so easy to clean a litter box. But look at that. That's my market, right? I gotta compete with the $8.94 scoop. <laughs> you know, I've gotta compete with all these litter boxes, this new speedy sift thing. You know, I got so much competition, even though I invented something unique. So it comes back to how am I defining my differentiation to the customer? Because they have this. Even walking down uh, an aisle at Walmart and looking on the store shelf, right? Look at how many options you have. All the price tags, oh, there's so much going on there. So you really have to be able to communicate your concept and speak to the customer. So this is the key, your unique selling point. I teach a class on brand messaging and I define brand messaging in a formula of three steps. Number one, Tell them what their problem is. What is your problem? Your litter box stinks. It stinks bad. What is your solution to that problem? Completely eliminate the odors. Get rid of them. The third part of that brand message is what does your look, life look like now with my product in it? If you're not communicating, whether you have a service-based business or a invention, if, if you're trying to sell your license to someone, for your idea, if you cannot communicate the problem the customer has, your solution for it, and what their life looks like now, you will fail. 
you will not get a deal. Because that's what we're focusing on. We're not focusing on features, you know. Oh, it has a it's stainless steel. Who cares? Why is it stainless steel? What does that do for me, right? So it's really, really key to everything, to communicating to the successful launch of your product. And can somebody tell me why you think it's key in scaling your business? So well, if it's not scalable, it's, it's not usable, really. I mean, you can't. You can't multiply it times, you know, a thousand stores or whatever. Yeah, exactly. So if you're not if you're not making sales right. by communicating your differentiation, then you're not going to scale anywhere, right? You're just going to stay right where you're at. You're going to keep trying to make sales. You're going to spend all this money on advertising that isn't going to convert. <laughs> but also, you know, what she's saying, you have to if you're an entrepreneur, you have to commu communicate with the customer. But the same thing applies if you're licensing. You got to communicate with a potential licensee. And it's basically the same thing, you know, so. You gotta sell it, either way. Either way, yeah. Mark Cuban said that if he lost all of his billions of dollars tomorrow, he would go and get a job in sales. Because he knows he might not make the billions back, but he'd at least be able to make a million back. And so that's just, that's a big thing. You gotta be able to sell. It's a really important part of your business. And how do you sell? By defining your unique selling point. So. Differentiator die. This is the part where I teach you how to evaluate your idea. How do you evaluate your idea to tell whether it's a good idea or not? So I talk with entrepreneurs all week long on coaching calls from around the world, and we always go through their ideas. And the first question I ask them is, can you define the problem? What, are you, what problem are you solving here? What need are you meeting, right? Does a solution exist already to your problem? So, you know, like the laptop cover, right? Tape. I, I talked to, um, oh man, I can't, I can't tell about that one because it hasn't been launched yet and I hope it doesn't get launched. But, <laughs> uh, so yeah. But anyway, um, so, you know, if, if you can't define the problem and a solution already exists, so for example, with my product, a solution already exists, right? There's a scoop, but I offer a better solution and I can define the problem because my solution eliminates odor and the scoop actually causes odor. So that helps me kind of define the problem and beat the reasonable alternative. So does your differentiation matter? So this is the second thing. A lot of people think, well, the product doesn't exist yet, so I can't find out if, if people really will want to buy it because it doesn't exist. Guess what, guys? This is, you know, the 21st century. We have Google. We have all kinds of great things. Do you know that you can actually check the search volume across the internet for the problem that you're solving? You can actually find out how many people are searching for that problem. There's a ton of tools to do it. So you can find out, you can validate your idea before even moving forward. Did you know, I'll give you a really quick hack, right? You can start typing in Google. And you know when you start typing in Google, you get like those suggested searches that pop up? That's the search engine's way of making people happy. It's telling people exactly what other people are typing in and saying, hey, maybe this is what you wanna look at. Maybe this is what you wanna look at. That stuff is updated on a regular basis. So if you want to find out if other people are searching for what the problem that you're solving, type it in. See what the autocomplete suggestions are. If there's some pretty high up autocomplete suggestions, you know you have something. And then my second little hack is look at the results. For example, um, in my course, an example that I give is I like to throw poker parties. And, um, I hate counting the chips before people come over. It takes me forever. I don't have enough of the fives and the 25s, and then I gotta start over, and I just, I don't like it. So I thought of this idea, like, what if I brought a, a custom poker set to the market, right? What if I did that? What if I had it where, you know, it was pre-counted, $1,000 in chips, and people come over, and I could just pull out the tray and give it to them, right? So I searched for how to count chips for a poker party. Tons of results, tons of all these blogs, 
recommending the, the, the count types, most of them said, you know, a thousand in chips and, you know, also I made sure that other people were solving the problem the same way, right? But guess what the solution was? The same old chips that don't solve the problem. So right there, I had validated that my idea was a good one. You can steal it. I haven't sourced it yet, you know. Um, but anyway, is there a reasonable alternative? That's number three. That laptop camera cover, that's the number one, right? So is there a reasonable alternative? You always have to think about other alternatives to your product. I know people always want to say, that's a unique idea. Nobody's done this. But people have done it, right? Even if you think of a different way to clean the cat litter box. There's other ways to clean the cat litter box. There's other reasonable alternatives. So you need to make sure that you're considering your competition. A lot of people say, I don't have any competition. I used to say that too when I first invented 50s. I was like, I don't have any competition. I'm inventing a new category here. I have competition. I had a lot to learn. So make sure that you're considering the whole market and not just what you think is unique, right? So validation. This is the number one thing that people skip. I cannot tell you how many entrepreneurs have come to me and have already launched a product and cannot sell it because they didn't validate that people actually wanted their idea. And now they're out hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases. I mean, my molds for Sifties alone were almost $60,000. Can you imagine if I hadn't validated the idea? If I hadn't figured out that someone actually wanted to buy this, that I was solving a real problem that people cared about, and oh, by the way, how much would they pay for it? Right, that's the thing. You need to find out what do people think of your idea and how much will they pay for it? Because I had this idea for, uh, for slime. My daughter, does any of your kids play with slime? Yes, right? Oh, it drives me crazy. Oh, it drives me crazy. So I had this idea, you know, like I was gonna bring this, um, my daughter, she plays with slime. She's in, she's like, all, she's got, you know, ADHD and she's always like playing with slime. She plays with slime all the time, makes her own slimes, all that. And I search on Amazon for a slime collection set. Something that, that she can store her slimes in because they're like a collection, you know? It's a suggested search term. It's the very first suggested search term and I'm like, Bingo, buying it tonight. Go to the results, nothing, nothing. Just like containers. And I'm like, oh man, okay. And then I was like, oh, money, <laughs> opportunity. So I was thinking, okay. So I designed this whole big slime collection thing, right? Where they could put, had shelves in it and they could put their slime in there and it was a wide container so they could play with it. And um, designed this whole big thing. Well, I validated it. I came back from China. I, I had a source for it. I had the right containers, all that. <clears throat> Came back from China. I had a little focus group at my house of kids and, uh, and, and their moms, because those are the ones that spend the money, right? Moms and dads. Um, and I had the kids with the samples on the table, the little prototypes, and I was like, hey kids, pick a container for the slime. And they were like, that one's fine. They just pick like the boring kitchen container, right? And then I asked the mom, I was, she, she was kind of playing with some of the other containers. And I was like, hey mom, what do you think? Like, does it drive you nuts that your kids always use your kitchen containers to store their slimes? And she's like, oh, not really. I just give them like a, a bag, like a Ziploc baggie or whatever. So here, I created this whole problem because of the suggested search term. I thought, oh man, people are searching for this, so I need to bring it to market. But when it came down to it, when I asked, how much would you pay for that mom? Because she was like, well, I guess if it was like stackable and it was cool and, you know, if it lit up and it was neat, like, yeah, I guess I, I guess I would get that. And I was like, how much would you pay for it, mom? Five dollars. Right there. I can't source it for that. There's no margins there. It's not a scalable business. It wouldn't pass the Shark Tank test. So that's the thing. You have to find out what do people think of it and how much will they pay for it? That's so, so important. You can't just ask one person, right? So you've got to validate your customer demand. So I'm going to give you some methods to validate your customer demand. You can do a visual mock-up. How much does it cost you to make a picture of this product idea that you're thinking of? You can go on Fiverr. It's like a freelancer website, right? F-I-V-E-R-R. -R. And you can type in like mock-up. And somebody who does 3D CAD like uh, like this guy over here, you know, they, they'll, put, they'll put it 
It'll make it look super cool and super real. Just like it's like, like it exists in real life. You take that and take, bring it to a Google surveys. Uh, like there's a pick, uh, pick for you, a pick F U is the website and you can get tons of opinions for really cheap. And you can just put two things up there and go, okay, so put your big competitor, right? So I can put like my sifting litter box in the, or scoop next to mine and I can say, pick one. Now that might cost me $40 to get a hundred responses, but how much did those molds cost me? <laughs> I mean, you want to validate your idea and how hard is it to pay somebody, you know, 50 bucks on Fiverr to draw a mock-up for you? Now, I know what you're thinking, right? This is the biggest thing that I get. People go, but Amy, somebody's going to steal my idea. They're not going to steal your idea. If you put it, now, if you put it in like my group of entrepreneurs, yeah, somebody's going to steal your idea. Don't do that. Yeah. But if you put it in like, if you're making a camping product and you put it in a group of campers, they're not, you just post that picture on Facebook in the group of campers, right? They're not going to know that this product doesn't exist yet. You're going to ask them those two questions. You're going to say, hey guys, what do you think about this? And you're going to get a bunch of answers. They're going to say, oh, I've seen that somewhere. Oh, really? Where? Oh, no, I just use this for that. Great feedback, right? Define your differentiation. Perfect. Or, uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Where can I get one? Where'd you get that? Really great feedback, you know? And then the second question is what? What would, you pay? Pay? Yeah. what would you pay for it? Right, because we want to make sure that we have scalable margins. So that, that's what you can, you just create a visual mock-up, show it to people, ask their opinion, record and analyze their responses. So method number two, I also have a, a little mini course for this um, and I help people like source like small, small amounts of products um, online and then they just throw them up on Amazon. So let's say that you have an idea to use a soap dish as a jewelry dish and it's a cool looking soap dish and it's different and you're going to sell it to the jewelry dish people and you just want to like test this concept right so you find a cool looking soap dish on alibaba or aliexpress and you source 100 units and you throw it on the market because who cares it costs you like 100 bucks right and then you get their responses and they go oh my god i hate the shape of this thing or you know i don't like the color well, great. Now you have some validation for your idea. So, you know, that's, it's an idea to just source something small and put it out there and just see what the marketplace thinks. Alternatively, you could do Kickstarter or you could build a landing page and say, Hey guys, I'm thinking about doing something like this. Uh, you know, if you want to sign up for my launch, let me know, you know, and then you get, you get a, a, a lot of good responses. When we were launching Sifties, we took the prototype to the Helotus market. And we demonstrated it for people and we said, hey, do you want to sign up for our email list? And they were like, yeah. Some people were like, no, it's not for me. I don't really like lifting my litter boxes and this is not for me. Uh, but other people were like, this is a great idea. How do I do it? Yeah. At what point do you protect yourself? In other words, do you, do you see if it's a, for, a good idea first and then protect yourself? Or? So if I think that, um, that you can do a mock-up, so you're... You have your drawings, you have everything there. Um, I don't think you have to go to provisional patent until you've actually done some initial validation. And you can do that initial validation on the internet. You can do that initial validation just in a group, right? Um, the mock-up is not gonna hurt you. But now, if you've invented, you know, uh, I don't know, like flying sneakers or something, yeah, you, you, might, wanna, you might wanna validate a decoy. So you might want to validate the flying skateboard because that's not your idea, right? But it's something very similar. So you, you get it either way. You definitely want to protect your idea. Don't get me wrong. But don't be afraid to at least do some initial validation, uh, you know, with some internet searches and at least the mock-up test. Now, the sourcing small idea where you're just throwing a couple, you're not actually selling your idea. You're selling something similar, right? If my idea is to sell this soap dish, you know, as a jewelry dish, you know, um, and maybe it's, it's a jewelry dish with compartments or something and I'm using, you know, whatever. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm sourcing a pill container and I'm gonna put that out there as a jewelry dish and see if it sells. You know, then obviously you're gonna differentiate it even more and you're going to then move forward with 
your, uh, your patent after that of, okay, now I'm gonna make these compartments exactly like this, they're gonna be round, they're gonna be square, they're gonna be tall, whatever. But in the beginning, this test is just a similar product, right? So avoiding errors in the process. Um, you know, you wanna ask people, but you don't wanna ask your mom. Don't ask your mom, don't ask your sister, don't ask your friend. You know, you want to ask strangers. In our course, we actually have homework and you have to go to the retail store and you have to talk to strangers and say, what do you think about this and how much would you pay for it? And people are super nervous because most of us entrepreneurs are introverts. How many people are introverts in this room? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Most of us are introverts. So this like gets people sweating in our group. They're like, whoo, I don't know if I can do it. And we actually had one of our entrepreneurs, he was in his car and he like sent us a video and he was like, I have been driving around all day long trying to do this homework. I'm just trying to build up the, the gumption to go and talk to people, you know. But then after they do it, they're like, this is great. So, uh, you know, I have some friends in Australia. And they invented this really cool fishing rod called the gunnel rod. Um, and it makes it so that anybody on the boat can fish. And so when they came to the United States to visit, I took them to Bass Pro Shops. And I said, hey, let's go talk to the, the sales manager in this fishing department. Let's ask him what sells the best in fishing rods, right? How, you know, what kind of things do, do his customers ask for? Like, that's a great way just to get good feedback. And these sales managers, they're bored, right? They're happy to talk to you. So don't be afraid to go, go and talk to people about your idea. All right, so when should you validate along the process, right? So you have your, your you find your idea. So now you're gonna validate your concept. We talked about that, like search on the internet, right? You're gonna validate that people wanna buy your product. Then you're gonna find a supplier. And so like with my slime container idea, I found a supplier. I was like, okay, I validated that the search exists for it and that there's a demand for it. Then I found a supplier. Then I came back and I validated the price. And what happened when I validated the price? Nope, it was a no-go. I had to walk away from it. But that's okay, I didn't spend any money, just a little time. Then I gotta validate the packaging because again, we gotta communicate our concept, right? We have to make sure our package communicates well, and then we can place an order with confidence. So one more thing here. It's time to plan now, guys. Don't forget to plan. If you have an idea that you want to bring to market, put that stuff down in a business plan. Okay, you've done your validation, you know who your market is, but the business plan helps you with this. Score, score.org, they have, you just Google free business plan template. Score has a really great business plan template and it actually walks you through each of these areas with instructions. You wanna know what your market looks like. I needed to know that there were 54 million cat people in the United States. I needed to know that, that's important, right? Plan to reach 1% of your target market. That's reasonable if there's an investor and you're trying to get some, you know, some money for your business, A, they're gonna want a pretty good business plan, a pretty good executive summary, and B, it's reasonable. You're not gonna be, I'm, I can't go to an investor and be like, there's 54 million cat owners and I'm gonna sell to all of them. No, my goal is to reach 1% of that market in three to five years, and this is how I'm gonna do it, because this is where my market hangs out, this is how I'm gonna market to them, market analysis, marketing plan. Your financials, you need to figure out what your startup costs are. Most of the inventors come up with an idea, and I was talking about this with somebody tonight, and we we're talking about how, ah, I was talking about it with you, where we were talking about how a lot of people are, what did you call them, the startup inventors where they, they don't have the money, like the home, the mom and pops, right? Um, so, you know, if you don't, if you're afraid to go with your idea, there's nothing wrong with making an informed decision about your financials. How much is your sales price gonna be? What are your startup costs? What resources are required? Tooling, molds, prototyping, research and development. I love being able to write off cat litter. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Distribution. How are you gonna reach your audience? There's so many cool channels. That's what we specialize in, helping people move beyond e-commerce and get their products in big box retail and specialty retailers. Amazon's only 5% of all of retail. Most people don't realize that. Anyway, map out your channels. Figure out how are you gonna reach that customer and what are the channels that you can, you can sell to the people that sell to the customers. You can be the private labeler. You don't even, you can offer, you can buy the tooling and offer other people the opportunity. Like I could sell 50s to tiny cats. There's a reason that my mold has a removable um, 
it has a removable plate for the brand name. Because maybe later on I want to sell that and they're going to want the tooling to go with it. Great. Short and long term goals. If you don't have goals, you don't know where you're going. I can't tell you how many people start on the journey to bring a product to market and they don't actually realize that they have to like have a real business then. Like they don't actually realize they're going to have to leave their job. They don't actually realize. I didn't realize it. I was just like, yeah, this is going to be great. I'm going to sell millions. And then one day I was like, oh my gosh, I have to quit my job. I'm not prepared for that. Oh, wow. I have to be an entrepreneur. Oh my gosh. I'm scared. So anyway, you got to have a plan, right? So uh, talking about a business plan, she mentioned you can go to SCORE, that's S-C-O-R-E yeah. dot org mm -hmm. dot com. Anyway, you can go there, but you can also go down to the UTSA Economic Development Center, which is the downtown UTSA campus down there on I-35, kind of in the middle of town. You can talk to uh, uh, well, one guy that comes to mind, Ruben Lopez, down there, and they'll do a business plan for you. They'll actually sit down, spend time with you, the zero charge. Uh, uh, it's a, uh, they have a yep. number of different uh, classes that you can take for like, some are cost nothing and some are maybe $20 or something like that where you sit in the class for maybe three hours. But I mean, you can just go talk to them, you know, in their office and they'll sit down and, and help you, you know. That's person actually person. who I went to when I started. I yeah. started and I met with the mentors down there. Yeah, um, <laughs> at some point you will outgrow their mentors. <laughs> yeah, but, 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 but to get started. To get started, it is an incredible resource. Yeah. I learned about marketing. I learned about how to refine my business plan. I had tons of, they have lots of mentors and SCORE does that as well. Um, so... Of the two things that we talked about, right? Validation. The second most important thing is profitability. You have to be profitable or what are we doing this for in the first place, right? So we teach our people, you need to have a minimum 7x multiplier. So what does that mean? What's a 7x multiplier? So your raw cost. What if my product price is $70? I'm going to sell this for $70 and customers have told me that... I, you know, that they'll pay $70 for it. What do I need to be able to source it for? If I divide that by seven, 10. So I need to be able to source that for 10. On Amazon, I usually aim for a 10X multiplier. That's always my goal. Um, I want to be able to source it for 10 and sell it for 100. Um, just because I need extra room. I like extra room for stuff. You know, when I get done selling it, I want to be able to buy a lot more um, and keep flipping that money over. But we teach people 7x because you need to have the markets. If you're going to sell to retailers, they expect to buy that product from you at 50% off of that retail price. So if it's $70 on Amazon, they're going to expect to, to buy it from you for 35 because they got to pay their overhead expenses, right? So you have to have enough margin to meet that. If you're sourcing it for 35, we got problems, right? Would you uh, know of any uh, in uh, particular categories of things where that rule may not necessarily apply? Well, there are businesses that go an inch deep and a mile wide. You know, so you may have um, a situation where uh, you ha you make it up via volume, right? So if you're you're able to sell a very small widget and you know for a dollar fifty, and maybe you're sourcing it for for half that price, right? Um, but that, that would, in my mind, that would be the only kind of exception to the rule is where you can make up for it in volume. Otherwise, you definitely want to, for a unique product, you want to have the margins, especially if you are going to try and get that product into retailers. You want to have the margins to make that happen. And 7X is it's the gold standard in retail. Um, so it's, it's, not, um, it's not like a number I'm making up. <laughs> so the different methods for sourcing. So how many people have sourced a product on like Alibaba.com? Anybody ever looked at Alibaba? All right, okay, so a couple of people looked at Alibaba. So it's cool because you can see all these different products. You can kind of see what's trending, what's going on. But it's also tough because um, you don't know who you're talking to. And there is some scary stuff happening out there. <laughs> I, have, I have some friends in China that work with some of our factories out there. 
And um, he was telling me, like, one of his friends actually works um, out of his apartment. He's just a guy. He works out of his apartment. And he sources from all these different factories. And um, he sells, like, phone phone accessories. And uh, and he's a 10-year gold supplier on Alibaba. He's a factory on Alibaba, but he's just a guy in his apartment on his laptop. So you don't know who you're talking to. And that can be really tough. And it can take a long time sending samples back and forth and trying to communicate your concept with somebody that doesn't speak your language very well um, can, can really take a long time. Sourcing agents is another way to do that, right? You can find a sourcing agent. The problem is in China, they actually have courses for college students to act as sourcing agents. You speak a little English, you can pass yourself off as a sourcing agent, you just go to this factory and you just add a little extra money on there. And so they don't actually understand manufacturing. They can't actually negotiate for you. They, they don't know what they're doing. So it's not that there aren't good sourcing agents. There are really great sourcing agents. There's, that's not what I'm saying. It's, uh, there's nothing wrong with using a buyer's agent. It's just there are a lot of shady characters out there. Uh, so you need to make sure as in any business decision that you're vetting your sources. The Canton Fair, we talked about that. Awesome, you can go shop all these factories at once, talk to them, go visit them. Uh, we actually take our participants on factory tours before they step foot in the Canton Fair because we want to teach them how to have the confidence to walk through a factory, what to look for, what should you be looking for, what certification should they have, how should they treat their people. Because if you get your product into retailers and that factory does not have the right certifications, you'll, your deal will go bad. So it's really important to know your factories and get out there and be part of the process. So that, that's why we bring people to China. That's why we help them experience this because it's, it can be overwhelming to think, oh, I gotta go to China by myself, right? And then referrals. The cool thing about referrals is sometimes you have a really good relationship with your factory. And let's say you want to invent a new product. You wanna do something else maybe in a new area. Well, you can ask your factory, if, as long as you have a good relationship, you can ask them, hey, will you tell, you, you know your cousin over there, he does, you know, soap dishes, right? Like, can you, can you refer me to him? Um, and, you know, what's great is you get their pricing, you get the brother pricing, and then they wanna take care of you too because you're an important client to them. So just, it's, uh, referrals is another way to, to find, find new factories. As How well. much does it cost to go to the Canton Fair, typically? It's free, it's free to register. Um, a ticket to China, a uh, plane ticket, uh, I actually, we went, we took the whole family, we went <laughs> bob sledding down by the Great Wall, that was kind of fun, uh -huh. but uh, we went to, um, we went to, we started in Shanghai, stayed a couple days, visited a couple factories, and we went to Guangzhou, um, stayed for the whole Canton Fair, that was, you know, several phases, different types of products in each phase, met our entrepreneurs there, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we went to um, Chengdu and we visited the pandas and we got to like feed the pandas carrots, they're so cool. Mm -hmm. And then we went to Beijing and, um, and I did a multi-city flight ticket. Uh, we went to Beijing and saw the Great Wall, right? It was like $700 round trip. Wow. It's very wow. affordable. And that was during, like when the most Westerners come to China uh, all, wow. yeah, all year long, right? So it's very affordable to go. Um, and it's it's a really cool experience. And if you sign up for the Canton Fair on their website, they actually have um, a business visa registration. So they actually help you get your visa. So you have to get an invitation letter in order to get a visa to go. But they'll take care of that for you. So that's really good. Yes, sir. Are the, uh, are the, the vendors or the factories sizing you up as, uh, as avidly as you should be them uh, as far as a customer? Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's really, that's a really important thing. This is why we have a whole course in this because there's important questions that you need to ask. So many people go to the Canton Fair and they'll just, they'll grab their business card and they'll walk up to the vendor and they'll go, yeah, uh, how much is this? And they'll go, oh, okay, here. And then they walk away. Well, in China, relationships are the most, they actually have a, they don't have that many words in Chinese, but they have a word for a business relationship. It's called Guangxi. And it's so important to them to build a relationship. And our entrepreneurs who have been sourcing from China for years and go with us, find they save over 30 to 40% on their prices after visiting their factories and building a relationship and learning what we have to teach them. And that's game changing for a business. You're talking 
$50,000 on one order. I mean, what could that do for a business? And so many people never even go and visit their factories. But when you build that relationship, it's a game changer. It's absolutely, it's so important to them. And so, you know, it's just remember, it's, it's about people. And I, actually, it's the next slide. So, you know, the goal of negotiating is to build a relationship, not win a battle. In America, how do we do it? Right? We sit down at the table. You sit over here. I sit over here. Let's go. What you got for me? Let's do it. It's not like that in China. In China, when you go and you visit your factory, they pick you up. They arrange all your transportation. They, we make tea together. We relax. We chat. We don't even talk business. Then we go to a big fancy lunch. Take me to a VIP room. We get to know each other better. You know, it's, it's called the long dance. And then in the afternoon, we do a factory visit. We kind of ask all the questions. I have so many factory visits are my favorite because I'm such a like prototyping and and uh, you know molding nerd. But anyway. Um, you know, it's, it's such a cool experience. And then you finally talk business after that. So it's just, it's really important to understand that if you build that relationship, if you remember that, and, and our number one thing that we teach people when it's about negotiation is we want the factory to be happy. We, our business needs to be happy with the pricing and our customers need to be happy. So that's something that we do when things get tense. We just say, Hey, remember, I want you to be happy. I want to be happy. I want you to make money. I want to make money. And our customers are going to be happy, right? And it just like breaks the ice. It really changes things for the way So what happens change. though if things don't work out? I mean, what, how do they feel about you then after they spend all this time showing you? Uh, I mean, is there a, is a normal, bad feeling or not? No, it's actually a normal part of business. In fact, um, we, we had a supplier um, that somebody else had a design patent on a product that we launched. And so um, we got back with the supplier and we're like, oh man, our stuff got shut down. Like, you know, we can't even sell this product. Like somebody had a design patent on it. And, um, and he did everything. Like the factory actually also had a patent. And so they sent us all the information and we submitted all that. But unfortunately, the one in the U.S. was the first to file. So, you know, we ended up, we just ended up selling the product locally. Um, but the, the bottom line is we went and visited him in Canton. <laughs> because it, there's no hard feelings you know he, we, we had a good deal and we worked together on that deal and you know he felt really sad about it and he, you know so it's it's all about that relationship it's okay if it doesn't work out you know in fact one of I went with one of our entrepreneurs to um, to two different factories and one factory drove us to the next factory and dropped us off after spending a whole day with them Guess what? She ended up going with the first factory. Do well, they speak English pretty well? Or? Yeah. Um, you don't need to bring a translator with you to China. Uh, there are so many, nowadays, there's so many like college students and stuff um, that, that they'll bring with them to like Canton Fair. And there's usually at least one person in sales at the factory that also speaks English pretty well. Mm -hmm. In some cases, you'll want to bring a translator uh, just so that, you know, if the, the English barrier is tough, that you, you have that covered. Yes, on the previous slide, you were talking about the only research on 1688. Can you elaborate on what that means on your previous frame? Oh. Sourcing agents? Oh, sorry. Okay. oh um, yeah, so that's what I mean. Like, um, some of the students will just research on 1688. What's that? Because, what is, oh, what is it? oh, 1688. It's, um, it's China's version of Alibaba. So it's in, it's all in Chinese. You can actually, it's kind of fun. Go to 1688, go to their website and you can actually go to Google translate and like type your thing, type whatever you're looking for in, in, in English and then like translate it and then throw that in the search bar and you'll, you'll see it, but you can also translate the whole page. Uh, Google will do that for you. Um, but China doesn't like Google. So I suggest Mozilla or some other browser, but, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah. So 1688 is just, uh, often we'll, we'll compare prices there too. And that's a good way to find out if, uh, if I also put like Taobao and some other apps on my phone that are Chinese apps. And, uh, you know, if, if it's selling on Taobao or the Chinese shop for $2 and I'm getting a price of $3 from my supplier, I know they're making some good money, right? Mm -hmm. So what chance do you take? Um, you go over there and you talk to them, you show them your product, you know, you discuss how it's made and so on and so forth, but then... Uh, it's free game over there if you don't have a Chinese patent, correct? No, no. Or do um, they, or do they, will they sign, uh, uh, 
Yeah, will they sign a, a NDA or something? So Can in, you trust that or not? So in China, it's um, we have a Chinese attorney, um, and that's how big brands protect themselves in, in China. So you follow their laws, and it's a lot easier. So uh, it's called an NNN agreement that you want to have in China. Um, and that is a non-compete, um, non-circumvent, and non-disclosure. So three forms of ends, but it has to be in English and Chinese. We have our Chinese attorney draft it up. Um, and our, our, when you use a Chinese attorney, like the factories take it very seriously. They look at that agreement and they're like, we've had factories tell us, uh, I'm not signing this. Like we need to make, we need to attach a photo of this. We need to do this and we'll make those adjustments. But um, they'll sign an NDA, no problem, because they know it won't hold up in China. So it's really important that you play by the laws of that country, right? Because you're not you're not going to get anywhere with your idea. So if you want to protect your idea in China, and that's why we have a course on this, because it, it is, people automatically think, oh, the Chinese are just going to knock me off, right? Like, they're just going to steal my idea, and it's just going to be the end of it. But there are ways to protect. We also recommend that you trademark your uh, brand name in China as well as in your area, wherever you're gonna sell. So if you're gonna sell in the US market, you also trademark that brand because there's this other thing that's going on um, where Ch China is a first to file for trademarks. So if they file a trademark on your brand name before it gets exported out of country, um, the, your goods will get held because they own that trademark. So that's another another really important thing. It's important, bottom line, it's important to have a Chinese attorney. Because for for me, for a couple hundred dollars, that Chinese attorney draws up general terms and conditions. They draw up my NNN agreements. They take care of everything. And they also contact the factory and go over everything. So then the factories know you're not playing, right? They know that, okay, everything is great. But again, the relationships that I have with my suppliers in China are beautiful. And we, I really feel like they're my partner in business. And I love visiting them and seeing my products being made. And it's, it's an incredible thing. And um, you can have those good relationships. You do need to protect yourself, of course. But the whole point is to build a relationship. The whole point is to make sure that you're doing your due diligence, you're building that relationship, and that you're protecting yourself from the laws of that country. Yeah, but you can't just go over there to Canton Fair and you're walking from booth to booth in, in your area mm -hmm. uh, where your product manufactures it, you know, and say, well, can you make this? How much is it going to cost? And then you go to the next. I mean, basically, you're, you're just throwing it out there for them to grab, right? Yes, I mean, no, so that's So you got to have your attorney go along with your Chinese no, attorney? No, no, no. So you source a decoy. So that's what we teach our entrepreneurs. Um, so let's say you're going to make a, the example that we use in our course is uh, uh, a Bluetooth speaker that's shaped like a puck. You know, uh, you know, you're you going to sell it to all the dog fans, right? My business partner is a big pug fan. I have two business partners with pugs. I don't know how that's working out. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but um, so let's say that you want to you want to create this Bluetooth speaker that's shaped like a pug and you know whatever, right? Well, you can always just talk to them about okay. So let's go find a Bluetooth speaker manufacturer and let's say. Okay, uh, what can we do with the, the casing here? Uh, what kind of colors can we make it? Can we make it multicolored? And you can source a different, you can say, I'm gonna, uh, I, I would like to make this in the shape of a fire hydrant. Could you do that? Yeah, you're gonna need a mold. Okay, well, how much would that cost me? You can always source a decoy. You don't have to give away your idea. And then when it's time to actually enter into, then you go to the factory, you visit, you can have them sign the NNN right there where you can then talk about the unique specifications of your product, or you can um, you know, just do the whole factory and continue on the decoy, and then when you make your decision, go back and ha you can even email them the document. Again, it's, it's, it's okay, but you can always source a decoy. You don't have to give up your idea when you're walking through the Canton Fair, and we don't recommend it. You just kind of sort of fake it, I mean, in, in a yeah. sense, yeah. Exactly. I mean, you take it, I mean, say there, you go over with this thing. So then you say, well, how much, you know, all you show them is a leg. Yeah. I need a leg to, that'll adjust and this and that or whatever. You know, you're not, and you go to another place and say, I need this connector adapter. And yes. you just show them that little part. You don't show them the whole thing. Yeah. And you can source yeah. different parts from different factories as well, but we always recommend that you have um, one factory that that is the lead factory that takes care of all parts of your product because you let them deal with the other parts. 
then they are responsible for holding those other factories to deadlines and everything else. So you only sign your agreement with that lead factory and then you make them source all the other right. stuff. But you can get a feel for, you can add stuff up. You can yes. say, well, this factory is going to cost me this much and this factory, mm -hmm. you know I mean, you can kind of put it together yeah. without having to sign an NNN or whatever. Exactly, so yeah. exactly. Yeah, you don't have to be afraid to source it, definitely. Well, now, are they fairly, I mean, so you sign an NNN, I mean, does that, they fairly, do they honor that pretty well? Uh, yeah, if it's done by a Chinese attorney, yeah, because they know that you can sue them for everything. If, I mean, yeah, you if, can. Yeah, yeah okay, well. absolutely. Yeah. So that's kind of. Does anybody have any other questions about sourcing from China? So this is our this is our course, and if you guys are ever thinking about going to China, you can definitely check us out. We have a lot of like videos on our site, as uh, George was mentioning. Um, but our goal is we also have a Facebook group where we're you know doing some free training on this stuff. But our goal is to help entrepreneurs. Our goal is to help them actually successfully source their products, to validate them, and to get their products on the shelf. That is the goal, you know, to actually build a scalable business. Is it just by class or can it be individual? So, or, or help or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I, I do consulting on an individual basis, so I work with lots of entrepreneurs on an individual basis as well. Um, but this is like a full course. So we do like weekly live coaching. It's over 40 hours of training before you go to the camp on fair. It's all online. So you're, you know, you're in a group with, um, all the other entrepreneurs that you're going to meet and you go through all of the courses and you get, you know, 150 page training manual with everything. And then you meet us in China. We take care of all the logistics and everything like that. So you don't have to be afraid to go and you can gain that confidence. Um, and the reason we did this was because there was a huge need and there were so many people that were not successfully making it or they didn't have the margins to make it. One of our, our partners here is Timothy Bush and he has a, um, a podcast called On the Shelf and um, he helps people get their products into big box retailers and he tells me all the time, he's like, Amy, I can't believe it. You wouldn't believe how many people make it all the way to Costco get their product on the shelf in Costco. That's a huge feat. Like that's huge. That's container loads. That's millions of dollars. That's the difference of like, you know, $3,000 a month on Amazon to $900,000 a month in revenue. Um, it's, it's a game changer for their business. They're not making any money because they've done everything up to their wrong. They've sourced at the wrong margins. They don't have the right relationships. They don't have the right protections. So that is why we put this together because we were like, we have to, people have to have the right resources to make it happen. So, but you can always, if you need some help along the way, um, you know, there's my email address if you need it. Um, if you need help along the way, you can always reach out to me. Um, you know, there's my website, amazingathome.com slash contact. I have an entrepreneurs networking group. People help each other and support each other and lift each other up. That's completely free. I do weekly training in there, completely free. So. Uh, my goal is to help entrepreneurs make things happen. Um, so that's all I have.